So if we lost you and you have returned, welcome back to our class and talking about this chart on atomic particles to atomic particles. And we were just about to read the quote. This is from the Mundako Upanishad, one of the major Upanishads commented on by Shankaracharya. And this quote sort of puts it into perspective for us. He says, Verily, that one indivisible consciousness is the indwelling essence in all things. Fire is its head, the sun and moon its two eyes. The unstruck sound of Om is its ears. The revelation of scripture is its cosmic mind. The many-tiered universe of name and form from gross to subtle is its heart. And its arms and legs are the four directions. Truth is its voice, the wind is its breath, and from its feet, the verdant earth has originated. Uh, that's why we love the Upanishads, because they're both full of truth and also very poetic and, and uh, appealing to us. So basically, that's that uh, beautiful sloka from the Upanishad, Agnir Murta Chakshusi Chandrasuryao Vishaha Shrotrivak Vibhritasha Vedaha Vayu Prana Hridaya Vishvamasha Padbayam Fit Prativi Earth Ki Sarva Bhutan Taratma from, from, it, the, from uh, uh, its feet the earth has originated so from that cos great cosmic being has come this earth and, and all of these things <coughs> that's a good quote to set off this chart uh, because it's something I wanted to present and I actually was a gift to my students I think two Christmases ago maybe one Christmas ago where on Christmas Day we were snowed in in Portland, Oregon at our ashram. So I spent the whole day on the computer and, and created this chart for us. Basically the setup is, is up one side it shows us how the matras, the particles refine from gross to subtle. And then uh, across the top and down the other side it shows how the consciousness of the soul takes these different gradations of, of particle and creates bodies from it. Uh, not just our bodies, physical bodies and subtle bodies and so forth, but all the worlds, all the planetary bodies and different bodies that come out, showing that they all come out of consciousness or in the beginning was the word and everything originated from the word. So in that way, you can say that it's, it's set up in such a way to show both the idea of particle and also the idea of manifestation or embodiment, how that is going on in a connected way. So you see there, maybe to set it off, it'd be good to talk in terms of physics a little bit. In the old classic physics, it, uh, they used to deal in, in, terms of na in terms of not nanometers, but um, microns. So they were thinking in terms of like, say, a human hair, you know, it's like 50 microns if you measured it. So the human eye can see a human hair, the end of a human hair if it looks at it. Maybe when you're older, you have to put it further away. But basically, you get this idea of 50 microns. That's how much they measured. Or smallest particles uh, that were actually visible to the human eye might be a, a micron or something. And then a red blood cell you know, would be uh, one nanometer. So you're beginning to get into a, a level of measurement that is finer and finer. In other words, they're going subtler and subtler on you, but they're going subtler and subtler into physical nature, not subtler and subtler into consciousness. So it's still an outward trajectory in my way of thinking. That is, if you look inside the body and you look at its cells and so forth, you're not going inside of consciousness, you're looking at the inside of the body only. So the same if you look out in space, you're going further and further back in time and you're, you're beginning to look at um, things that are extremely external. And if you take an electron microscope and begin to examine little particles of objects, you're also examining their most external component. And you're going so far external that pretty soon your particle is appearing to change at a billionth of a second, the rate of a billionth of a second. And instead of making the conclusion like Buddha did or like like Buddhism did, that all this is then empty, it's just appearance. You're instead, you're trying to grasp at a more, uh, 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 the next level of particle, you see. And so you're being drugged further and further out away from 
this kingdom of heaven within you. You're going into the external of the external. So that's what happens when you begin to try and measure things only in physical terms. But if you were to jump beyond nanometers, say a DNA mar man uh, molecule is 2.5 nanometers. <coughs> 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 If you say if you put six silicon atoms side by side, that would be like a nanometer. So you're talking an infinitely small measurement. Like a glucose particle is about a nanometer measurement. So if you're a diabetic, then what's killing you is you know about a, that small. A tiny germ can kill a huge elephant, as Jerome Chris used to say. So you've got these very very tiny tiny measurements. A hydrogen atom is one tenth of a nanometer. That's one of the smallest things. And so the point here of bringing these classic physics and quantum physics into the picture is that it's a way of explaining possibly to people who don't believe, who are atheists or who are agnostics or who are just scientists or intellectuals, and they're trying to ponder some of the secrets of the universe, then we might want to introduce them to this thing called prana or life force. Man does not live by bread alone as Christ said. So he realized a particle or a station of consciousness where the ancestors have gone, which is not measurable by nanometers or microns anymore, could only be ma uh, measured in terms of a new kind of particle that is subtler, not grosser. Because you're going from gross to grosser when you go outward and outward so much. The object should be outward enough for you but now you're wanting to know what the object is made of. And when you find out that the object is made of particles that are changing in a billionth of a second, and you cannot make a conclusion that says, it must be an illusion, it must be an appearance, then you're up a creek without a paddle. You believe in a physical world only, and that physical world itself is made up of particles which you can't understand. Thus, the Vedanta says, you cannot know the nature of an object. In the... Cha in the um, in the uh, in some of the scriptures this is stated you cannot know the nature of an object it's impossible to know it because you'll just find up wait find yourself wading deeper into changing particles that are changing so rapidly that they're just like shifting sands so <clears throat> instead why not graduate in your consciousness to a different level of particle that's where your ancestors have gone when your, when your baby was born and your grandfather died, they were coming in and out of an intelligent particle, a realm in consciousness, a kingdom of heaven that's within you, a chamber of my father's mansion. So here's where theology and science could, could possibly meet and have some discussion. And it would be based on this idea that the particle, when it changes inwardly, instead of outwardly where we're looking, changes into prana, from ana to prana, from particles of food. What's in food? Energy, right? Prana. Man does not live by food alone. He lives by something that's in food. Man does not move his arm alone. He lives by something that's the energy of moving his arm that could be traced back to the energy in food and maybe the willpower of the mind and the senses and so forth. But there's this energy in between called prana, or in Hawaii we could even call it mana, or in Taoism you could say chi, or how, whatever the correlations are in other places. In, in Vedanta it's prana. And that is a particle, <coughs> and that's what's instanced here. After you get through with the particle of matter, which comprises humans, animals, insects, plants, in your waking state, then you're going into a dreaming state and that's where these particles of life force, that's where the celestials, the ancestors, and those beings called elementals are residing in the nether realms, sometimes they call it, or the intermediary phases of existence. More of an astral kind of idea, you see, if you go across the chart. So basically the pranamatra, we start out with the anamatra, the particle of food, and then uh, that would go to the prana, uh, prana matra, an, uh, a, a particle of energy. Not kinetic, not electric, because those again are forms of outer energy, but an energy that's, uh, that is subtler, and which comprises a whole area of unseen realms. 
kingdoms of heaven within you. So prana is not known by very many kinds of types of beings, like the shamans know a little about it, and you know, uh, the metaphysicians, the healers, people like this know something about prana. They know there's some sort of a force there, life force that's flowing, and when it gets crimped up, then it stops, and there's some atrophy, and there's various problems that come from that in the body and mind. But uh, the yogi meditates on prana to find out its origin, and would immediately notice that if you started with, say, food, and uh, the human being ate the food, and it was transformed into sperm, and the sperm was given to the womb, the mother, and the ovum, and the, produced the fetus, and then the fetus produced a, a human body, and the human body grew, and the brain developed, and the brain de developed some sort of intelligence, that this is called the material cause of things. And this is what everyone believes in. This is, this is, to them, the origin of things. It all begins with food. Now, not only the worldly person says that, even those who are into religion say that. Yes, it's all based in food. It all begins with food. All the religious systems of India are talking about food. But in this case, it's considering the sacredness of food. And that's missing in the worldly way of looking at things. The sacredness of food has been sort of X'd out of the equation. We don't eat it with reverence. We don't eat it knowing that there's a power in it. And then we don't take that power from food and bring it up the spine with spiritual practice so that it can turn into light, intelligence. So intelligence and food and practice all have this connection, this deep connection with one another. If you just eat food and you become a healthy ma animal, then you haven't connected to prana and intelligence yet. You're just eating food and becoming a healthy body and then you're dying later when prana wanes out of the system. Your eyes go blind, your ears can't hear anymore, your body, when prana vacates, it's all over, you see. But so you can live your whole life without knowing anything about this life force that's causing you to move, causing your eye to blink thousands of times a day without knowing it and is responsible for carrying souls out of the body to another realm of existence. Out of the body means in to the prana realm, the realm of the ancestors. <clears throat> there are nations who worship their ancestors, like Japan. That's pretty much it for some, some cultures, for some religions, it's just ancestor worship. India itself was very much deeply into ancestor worship, it still is in many ways. But that's considered a sort of lower form of the religion. The Vedanta is actually begins to direct you more towards gods and goddesses, doesn't it? That's a higher form of consciousness. And then it begins to direct you toward the sages and the seers and the teachers. That's a higher form of consciousness. And these are all called chitmatra or gyanamatra. I mean, basically, the gods and goddesses are here at the level of particles of thought. From particles of food, and the energy that's refined for them comes our thought. If we don't eat, we don't think. We become a non-entity. We fall. So we're taking the prana from food and it's activating our brains and the power of thought is there. And all of a sudden we've reached a particle of chit. Chit is mind stuff. It's the thought process of our mind that's going on constantly. And in that, in that process is this very fine particle that's graduated from prana to understanding or to thought and from thought it will it will uh, actually graduate to a particle of intelligence jnana matra which we were just talking about over the last four weeks time now in the realm of thought or mind are these realms of gods and goddesses celestials angels if you will various beings are occupying this thought that's beyond the ancestors. It's a finer level of particle than the ancestors is. So you're, when you talk about all of the realms of name and form and time and space, earth, Burloka, Bhuvarloka, the lower heavens, Svarloka, the higher heavens, uh, uh, Maharloka, the realm of the sages and the, and the uh, 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 the celestial beings, uh, and then the uh, 
uh, Jnana Loka and Tapar Loka and Brahma Loka all the way up to the level of the Trinity, you're talking about a march of particle that's finer and finer and finer towards like the sugar cube uh, melting in the tea, you see, till finally there's just one homogeneous mass of awareness and there's no particle left. And that's called samadhi or nirvana. So that's all the dis dissolution, you see, of name and form. It can happen apparently out here in space over 4 billion, 320 million years, and we'll call it a Big Bang and an end to everything. When the energy from the Big Bang gives out, it'll fizzle away and then there'll be nothingness, a void. You see. But as I've been saying, you should probably avoid the void if you can. Don't be a nihilist. You should annihilate nihilism. And take that away from your mind because there's always a witness watching this process. You can never deny the one who's doing the denying. So you can, de you can explain away everything, but there's an explainer there, you see, who's trying to explain away things. And that's you. That's the eternal witness. So uh, get in touch with that and watch these processes go on and go by. And so the beings that are the best witnesses are beings who know about this dissolution of particles in one into the other. You, you hear about levels of consciousness all the time, but you never really stop to think about them in terms of something, say, that even science could grasp onto. The tantrasists of ancient India, the Vedasists of ancient India, and other religious uh, traditions that I've mentioned today, all were thinking in terms of the word, and vibration was a key thing to them. In Shaivism, the whole key is spanda. Spanda means a vibrational sphere. So you have all these different words and different traditions you come upon that are talking about these kingdoms of heaven within. <coughs> Unfortunately, Christ probably didn't have the time to explain to fishermen the fine subtleties of philosophy and what he was experiencing in Gethsemane, and that's its game. <coughs> and if you're a yogi, you want to stop the game, turn off the light, stop the mind from projecting. Isn't that what everyone's trying to do when they meditate? Why is everyone trying to meditate? Don't they know that that's the end of the world? Only a few people try and meditate. And of those few who try to meditate, they they don't really know what they're doing. They may sit eight hours and at the end, they don't know that basically what they're doing is that if they attain meditation, that means the end of form for you. Now, nobody wants the end of form. So meditation is somewhat of a charade going on sort of a pseudo practice with people. But if you really knew why you were sitting to meditate, you'd know that just like going into deep sleep tonight, you're going to turn off the worlds. Only now you're going to do it consciously. You're going to be at the switch of the mind. Not coincidence or serendipitousness or the devil or, or luck or destiny or karma even. You see, Those are all relative laws. You're going to be the one that stops that stream of conscious particles from doing what they do and turn it off and withdraw it back in like Buddha did under the bow tree. And then it's all over. Have no hope for me for the world forevermore. I am gone and gone forever. Or he put it another way, architect of the universe, I have seen you. Now I will not project bodies anymore. I won't project bodies of wood, houses of wood, houses of stone, I won't project houses of blood and flesh and bone. I won't project houses of wise conception with my mind. I stop projecting. See. This is why he sat and why he understood and why he achieved nirvana. And after he did, he couldn't speak about it. They had to coerce him to try and speak about it. Out of compassion, they say, he came to say what he had experienced in the form of state. Christ did the same thing in the wilderness. He was completely stunned and sat there for days without moving when he saw the kingdom of heaven within him, how vast it was. And the stunned part of it was probably, oh, I see, this is my doing. I've been blaming this on God and devil all this time, but all of this is my doing. In the tantras, there's some beautiful slokas saying, uh, you know, salutations to you, adorable self, you see, the architect of the universes. I salute you. 
You are the darling of my own, of your own worship. You are the darling of your own worship. So, salutations to the self, who's doing all of this. You see, who's projecting it, who's sustaining it, and who's withdrawing it. You say, well, isn't that Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva's business? But if you look close enough, you'll see Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in you, as the power to create, preserve, and destroy. If you're worshiping Shiva outside somewhere, that's only the first stage of worship. Gauna Bhakti, we went through that last week. But then there's Rag, Raga Bhakti, that's the next stage where you see that that salagram or that Shiva Lingam or whatever it was, that picture of Shiva you were worshiping, now begins to radiate from inside of you. See, you, can't, you almost can't even believe it. You say, wait a minute, I thought he was outside me. No, I see he's actually inside me. He's the one that's worshiping himself. And then you move from Raga Bhakti to Prema Bhakti and Shiva becomes Jiva. And Jiva becomes Shiva. That is, the embodied soul is Shiva. Jiva is Shiva. My teacher used to always say that. And now all you're doing is, is, is just deifying everything. You renounce the unreal part of it. You deify the real part of it. So renunciation is deification. It's not condemnation. If you're renouncing the world because you're condemning it, then you haven't understood the connections yet. You're jumping to some supreme position without being qualified. You'll have to come back later and work that one out. But if you realize that all of it is as you renounce all of this, it turns into Brahman, then that is the true renunciation. You're taking the unreal quotient Maya out of the picture, and what's left over is Brahman. And the same percent not only pertains to all of this, but it pertains mainly to you. you see. Now, Maya, I'm not in Maya anymore. Maya is in me, so I have to just take it out and discard it somewhere. So when I do, I'm beginning to vibrate at a level of particle that the gods and goddesses and the seers are vibrating at. And now I know where they go when they die. See, there's all this squawk about, oh, where do souls go when they die, you see? Well, number one, they don't die. Let's start on a good footing. There is no death. Death is an illusion. If you believe in death, that's the lowest hell that you could possibly fall into, according to Indian philosophy. Belief in death is the lowest hell, no doubt. There is no lower hell than that. Because it's absolutely false way of thinking. You are a birthless, deathless soul, spiritual entity, however you want to put it, Atman, Buddha nature, borrow a term from wherever you want, it's eternal consciousness. <clears throat> so where do you go when you die? Well, if you're enlightened, you don't go anywhere because you are all pervasive consciousness. When Ramakrishna passed away, all his 16 direct disciples thought they'd feel bad, but when he actually passed away on the day he felt they felt him more inside of them than ever and this there they realized that his outer body had been a sort of impediment to realizing the inner Ramakrishna inside of them so as soon as he passed away they looked at his dead body and then they looked for him and they found him inside of themselves he, he had just he had just returned to f full manifestation of the Atman inside of them and so they carried him for the rest of the, the rest of their lives. That's in the Ramakrishna order bylaws. See, we are just different parts of Ramakrishna's body. Some of us are his hair, some of us are his arms. You know, Vivekananda is probably his right arm. So this idea of Brahman and everything is not just some highfalutin philosophy, nor is it speculation. It's the reality of the situation. But you will not know it until you find some way of getting a handle on it. So here's one way I would say of getting a handle on it. Just think of, if you're thinking in terms of vibrations and particles, just think of how particles can become subtler and subtler rather than grosser and grosser. And then you could you could, the scientists and the theologian, you know, could shake hands with each other and say, we have a way, a common ground now of, of speaking about this. 
My realm may be physics. Your male realm may be metaphysics. Someone else's realms may be philosophy or, 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 or uh, spirituality. But nonetheless, we have a way of understanding what's happening to souls as they come and go. I mean, if you go to the Kundalini system, it's probably the best way to explain how there's these lotuses, chakras, right? Seven of them in your, in your associated with the human spine, and in, they're not the human spine and the body, but associated with them. They're in, a, in another dimension, as you might say, inside of the, of the physical one. And so there are 100,000 nadis, nerves. Nada means sound. Brahman, om, means om. So everything is vibrating in this vast world of nerve endings. You know, I mean, the, the human body is miraculous enough, isn't it? You say if you take the nerves out of the body and tie them together, they'll stretch from here to New York or something. You see, so imagine in just one body how many nerves there are, but imagine inside the subtle body of a human being how many nerves there are. These aren't nerves that you can see or dissect with a scalpel and study, but you'd have to study them with your eye made single. And you'd see that as you looked at them, they're stretching from here all the way to Vaikuntha, not just to New York, you know from here all the way back to the inner eternal city of Vaikuntha where Krishna dwells. And, and basically, all by a series of networks of subtle nerves, and if you looked at the subtle nerves closely, you'd see the souls running along them by the power of prana. Prana is the Garuda bird that carries Vishnu. Prana is that energy which carries thought from one plane to another plane carries the mind. Body dies, but mind goes on. See? Brain also dies with the body. But mind goes on. Mind is the soul in my tradition. As long as it transmigrates, then it's a complex. As soon as it dis is able to dissolve itself, then it stops being a complex. Nothing's complex anymore. It's all simple. See? Like Buddha under the bow tree. It's all simple now, simple truth. So watching the nadis, hundreds and thousands of them connected to the heart, <coughs> the heart uh, chakra is the main chakra. Three below, three above. <coughs> How's that for three putis? So with 100,000 subtle nerves connected to the heart, now you know where souls are going when they leave the body and how they come back in when they attend upon the mother's womb. See, this chakra is second chakra, Manipura, is the hub for all your ancestors. Flowing right in, it's where food gets digested, so it's essentially connected with the prana. And it's where souls are coming in and out of the body from the ancestor realm, back and forth from the, pranama, from the pranamatra to the anamatra, from the subtle body back to the physical body. So, What's all this wonder then about where, how many souls there are in existence and where do they come and go? Number one, they don't come and go at all. It's a dream. <laughs> They're not coming and going at all. They're just appearing at different places in different bodies that they take on and give up due to the design of their own in intellect. And number two, when they do apparently come and go in and out, then you have your father dying or your grandfather dying and your baby being born out of whatever chakra it has to be these lower chakras because the other souls are going to exit out of the heart the throat the third eye or the crown chakra and when they take on a body they're going to come down again from supreme consciousness into the physical body and they'll do it because they know the particles the realms of particle through which they have to travel i mean read the tibetan book of the dead and in other wordage, other verbiage, you'll find out that pretty much the Rinpoche or Tulku is, is guiding the dying Tibetan soul through these realms of existence. Speaking to the dead body as if it was alive. <laughs> Why, he can't hear you, he's dead. No, he has subtle senses. He's hearing me with his subtle senses.
he's in a dream like now, but he's not completely uh, away from his body yet. He's still associating with his physical body. I mean, it's not that easy to give it up if you've been in it for 80 or 90 years. You can't just give it up like that. It might take seven days, one bardo, to get out of my association with the body, or 14 days or 21 days. In the meantime, I need some guide to tell me what to do in, in here. <laughs> I'm knocking around inside of this subtle body, and I don't know how to get to my causal body, nor do I know how to get to my Buddha nature. So someone tell me, because I didn't study when I was living. Let's see. I was too busy studying objects, having relation with objects. And so I never went after the eternal subject, I went after the infernal object. <laughs> so as you graduate these particles, you'll come to a particle that's so rarefied it's called Lyamatra, Om. That's where the Trinity is. If you see pictures of the Trinity, like Ram, Sri Ramachandra, see, you see there's a Om sign painted on his hand. See. So he's, he's showing you this mudra, which means abhaya mudra, you see. It's the abhaya mudra. It means be fearless. I'm the last form you'll ever see, but be fearless. See. So when you get there, it's the last form. It's the dissolution of all particles. Laya matra, laya means dissolution. That's sip. Form is gone. All soluble back into the word, like a sugar cube in hot water or tea. So the Trinity is telling you, this is creation, preservation, and destruction. Everything below here, from that chakra down, is all the worlds of name and form and time and space spread out across the field of your own consciousness in vibrational particles vibrating at different rates of speed. And some of them are grosser, and so they got solidified, and some of them are finer, so they became less solidified. So finally they came right up here to the sun. And you'll get to the Father through the sun. Most people will have to go through the sun. And when they do, then they'll experience this great Brahman, homogeneous awareness. The only traces of form there maybe the nichasiddhas or the avatars because they will congeal out of a formless state and come back into form again and also their highest devotees can do that, the Ishvara Kotis. Those beings can uh, give up themselves into the highest Brahman and then recongeal, recongeal everything again because they know the uh, worlds of name and form and all their gradations like the back of their hand. They couldn't be a bodhisattva or a Jivan Mukta if you didn't. Because there was at one point you saw the architect of the universe, as Buddha said, and you said, okay, I want off the merry-go-round now. Or you came to Lord Brahma and you said, beautiful creation you got going on there, I want out. I've had enough of birth, death, growth, disease, old age, pain, lust, anger, greed, envy, jealousy, pride, delusion. Need I go on? These are all your playmates at recess. So take the world of creation back with you. Speaking about the beautiful Upanishads, there's one sloka where the man is pa passing away, the monk is passing away the body, and he says, Oh Lord, there's the sun in the sky. Can you kindly remove it so I can see the real light? Kindly remove that orb, that golden orb in the sky, so I can see your real light. So this is no fool at the time of death. This is a person who knows that the worlds of name and form and time and space and all of nature are a covering over Brahman. And they distort the perfect Brahman, apparently so, that is. Avarana Shakti covers and Vikshepa Shakti distorts. 
forms of maya. But what they want is the revelatory power. So he's saying, remove all suns, the billion suns in the sky, in the night sky, remove them so I can see the true light of consciousness, which is my true nature. So that's a person who is speaking from the standpoint of the Laya Matra. So he's seen the particles all dissolve. They got so re refined and he was meditated on them and he, he dissolved it as, as she was saying in the, in the goddess scriptures, the Divine Mother was saying, you know, they got so refined that, that he just graduated with them. He was able to take them in and turn his own consciousness into those finer and finer levels. Refine his consciousness. Beautiful songs about it too. I mean, Jaya Jaya Jagavandini, Jaya Jaya Jagavandini, Dei. Just one verse of a beautiful song to Devi Dukkha Harini Tarini, Devi the goddess Dukkha Harini, who removes Dukkha, suffering, with her compassion. So he has realized that Chit Shakti, who is the source of all intelligent particles, from whom the music is made. That was vibration you just heard, right? And the vibration was put together with words, and the words were put together by someone with intelligence, obviously, and also someone who had devotion to something that usually we don't see, taste, touch, hear, or smell, or some of us don't even ever think about. Most of us in this day and age never think about. What about that? What about the reality of that? What about its existence? Can anyone deny it? So not being able to deny it, then we should probably look deeply into it. Who is this mother of all intelligence? Vak Devi. Vak, the word, Devi, the goddess. Who is the goddess of the word? And how does she operate the worlds of name and form and time and space? How do they spill out from the word? And how, please tell me, O oh mother, can I retract them? Can I withdraw them back into me? Because if all my problems are out there, then when I can dissolve everything out there, my problems will dissolve with it, you see. There are no problems in deep sleep, so tonight I have it down for about two hours. But when I wake up from deep sleep, which I went into as a fool, I come out a fool. And then I believe in the waking and dreaming again, right? And so I go ahead and I wake and I dream with my compatriots and my partners, you see. And then maybe once a day I'll sit in meditation and try and do this consciously, you see. So try and do the very same thing I did last night in sleep, naturally, only consciously, with my own intelligence. And then the practice of meditation has a beginning. And it should have an ishtam too, ishta devi. So the mother would be your, your uh, chosen ideal and form. And then one day you too would be praying to her, please take away the sun in the sky so I can see a real light. It's time for me to exit this realm of form. And you wouldn't be caught off guard anymore. So you wouldn't be uh, in fear, in ignorance, and in doubt. Did you know that those are the three things that make up the curtain of nations? The cloud of unknowing you hear talked about in Buddhist schools. I was thinking, what's that made of, you see? You can't just say, oh, a curtain of nescience falls over you when you go to sleep tonight and you don't know anything. That bothers me, you see. I don't accept that. I'll know what it is. Thank you. So Lord Shiva, you get in touch with him and he says, yes, 
the luminaries have said that the curtain of nations consists of fear, brooding, and ignorance. I'm sorry, fear, doubt, and ignorance. And the brooding which attends upon those three primal causes. So the three primal causes to your unknowing, to your ignorance, to your lack of insight, to your <clears throat> being bereft of samadhi, your natural state, is fear, doubt, and ignorance. Primal root ignorance, mula vidya it's called. And you're making the situation worse, how? By brooding on fear, doubt, and ignorance. <laughs> so do not spend any more time in that habit of brooding. Give it up. Completely, it's a waste of time. Start thinking about your true nature. Start reading the scriptures. Start meditating on reality. Start coming to my three-hour classes. I'll just put that plug in there real quick. <laughs> Go anywhere where you can get some definitive wisdom in a flow. See, that's coming from a tradition that has the wisdom principle and particle in spades, in droves, and can explain it to you. This same process can be explained coming out. I mean, this is going in, right? From the physical particle to the pranic particle, from the pranic particle to the mental particle, from the mental particle to the intellectual particle, and from the intellectual particle to no particles, om, and to abidance in your own formless essence, swarupa, or brahman, or absolute reality, and you want to come back in and congeal the particles again, or it happens. As we say, our bumper sticker in Vedanta, chit happens. Because chit is intelligence. So let's change it around here a bit. Chit really happens. And so as it, if it happens in this way, you're coming down and congealing a particle. What you're doing is taking on a causal body again. Particles of formless intelligence held in abeyance and potential. That's unmanifested prakriti. So you have to go to this second stage of the word, pashanti, from the para stage of the word. I didn't get to finish that teaching earlier, but from the ultimate stage of the word where there's not even a conception of form, now you're coming down into a sort of vague conception, distant conception of a form, some space that can hold a concealed form of your own intelligence. It's a far cry yet from the physical body, uh, but it is called a causal body. And there's very, very little said about it in the scriptures and very, very little of it comes from the teachers. It's an indeterminate state. That's what the scriptures call it. But it's blissful. It's your ego, really. I mean, they, they often made it off with anandamaya kosha. You, know, you, you understand the five koshas, right? The body is anamaya kosha, same as ana. Then pranamaya kosha is the uh, sheath of energy, and then manamaya kosha is the sheath of mind, and then uh, vigyanamaya kosha is the sheath of in intellect, and then anandamaya kosha, the sheath of bliss, is your ego. That's where all your bliss is coming from, is my sense of separate self, you see. It's, it's, the, it's the devil in disguise. The real light is coming from Brahman, but you've got this little light. And Brahman's the sun, and you're the moon. Right? And you're thinking, I shine, I shine, look at me. You see? But you're only borrowing light from something else. So the ego is this sort of separate eye maker. That's how Lord Vishista called it. It's a separate eye maker. It makes little separate eyes like cookie cutters. <laughs> takes the individual Brahman and makes it into individual jivatmans. Mm -hmm. Pump them out, just like nature does. So if you're here in the causal body, you're in formless nature already. Say hi to Elvis and the dinosaurs because that's what's there. Everything in potential is there in unmanifested property. Guess what? It never died. 
So you give up your idea of death at this point. It never died. It just went into abeyance, into potential. And that's where you will go too, and unless you give up this transmigrational process like Lord Buddha did. Say, I will have no more uh, truck with nature anymore. So I, will not, I will not take a form again. So coming down in that level, you take on a subtle body and then a uh, causal body, sorry. And then you'll have to come into a subtle body, which is pretty much across the board. You're talking about you know, these are connecting in, uh, in such a way. So if you take on a subtle body, you're talking about particles of conceptional thought projected as multiple expressions. At this point, there's going to be no doubt to you if you have your consciousness intact and in tow that you're the one that's projecting all of this. And it, yes, it might be in tandem with billions and billions of other separate I, eyes, separate egos, you see. But nonetheless, part of that cosmic mind has become the collective mind, and that collective mind is rapidly becoming the individual mind. And the power is uh, throughout. You're, you're born with the same power of the cosmic mind in you. That's what makes you a great genius or a great seer or a great intellectual. That same power that's in the cosmic mind is also in you. So cosmic, collective, and individual is another triputti to meditate on, all of these three levels of consciousness. You might as well call it the causal, subtle, and individual body of things. So when you're in the subtle body, you're in the mind, basically. The kingdoms of heaven really are the mind. The mind is a vast territory. It's infinite territories. Inside of each loka, there are billions of worlds. Does it surprise you when inside of this loka, called Bur loka, the local of physical objects, there are also billions of worlds? So why should it surprise you? The thing about those Pranakasha and Manakasha and so forth are as those worlds are peopled by billions of beings and these aren't, most likely. There's probably been nobody up there in space. You know, you'll just see a footprint of a human being somewhere in some lava somewhere. Because the human being is it. From the human being came the idea of extraterrestrials. It came from your mind. And the mind is very good about fantasizing and imagining and conceiving and dreaming. And uh, an octopus might as well be an extraterrestrial. That's a strange being in another world, isn't it? So out of, out of all those worlds inside of these rarefied akashas made of cosmic principles and intelligent particles are these billions and billions of souls. So make your introduction to them as you come down into them. There's Indra, the god of gods. I salute you, Indra, but I, I won't become a part of your world right now. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm transmigrating. I'm a transient. I'm a transient whose, whose, whose whole purpose is transience. But what I really want is transparency see, and transcendence. Never mind. <laughs> so out of the subtle body, then where else to come but the physical body? Astral body is sort of, people got all up on that in the 60s. I don't make much out of it. If you had a vision of, from your hospital bed on the time of your dying, or if, if you found yourself levitating on the ceiling, or uh, you know, if you, if you had a drug experience and, and so forth and so on, you were probably astral projecting. And that's just a form of dream in the, in the, in the waking state. You're not going in, inward at all. You're actually playing with the outward in a, in a slightly subtler way. But if you're actually in the subtle body, then you've gotten into the conscious particle, into the chit mantra. And inside of there, you're a prakriti laya. You can play with nature. You can play with formless nature. And 
there are beings who make a whole lifestyle out of that. They're called prakritilayas, poor things, basically, because they create worlds of name and form, like this is where the idea of cloud castles in the sky came from, is that create whole worlds and people them with creatures of your design, live for aeons, and then your world falls apart when, you're, when you wake up from the dream, and all your beings disappear, they, they leave you. All those flower garlands they put on you wilt. And you're left with nothing but your own projecting power again. So practically liars are just taking unmanifested nature and playing with it. And in a sense, that's what human beings are doing too. Somebody made a comment to me the other day, one of my students, and said, that's just kind of a mixture of Maya and Brahman, isn't it? I said, the mixture of Maya and Brahman is what most of you are doing. The guru is here to help you to stop doing it. Just keep Brahman pure and let Maya go. Because relationships and money and, and all the various things that we're engaged in is just mixing Maya with Brahman. And it's not a good mixture. It's a, not a good admixture. Take Maya out of the quotient and just have the pure Brahman. I am that, isn't it? And live in I am that. Not I am every other thing as well. That thou art. He didn't say this thou art, there thou art, then thou art. He said that thou art. See? There's the five T's as well as the five W's, you know. So coming down out of the subtle body, the five W's, by the way, are what, where, when, why, and who. What is objects and where is space and when is time and so forth. Who is the question you want to ask because that defines everything. If you come away from this class on the Gyana Matra or the series of classes at least knowing that then you'll be on good footing you see. Who am I? That's the question to ask. Who is doing this? Because then you're identifying you know, you're indicating the source of creation. But what you want is beyond creation. What you want is a create. Brahman is a create. It doesn't give rise to dreams. Maya does not exist in it. Physical body. And do we let's see here? Subtle body is particles of conceptual thought projected as multiple expressions. Astral body is particles of desire based thought caught in dream states and fantasizing. Physical body is particles of dense mental vibration congealed into objects. So the whole thing has become denser, hasn't it? It's congealing. Until it's so congealed that now I see Brahman has become objects. Trauma Christ used to say, Brahman has become all things. But he could say that because he kept the knowledge of what Brahman is in his third eye as he got into the world. Everyone else gave it up and just said, this is a world with objects in it. And they didn't say this is Brahman. You see what I mean? If you come down out of this process and lose along the way your knowledge of Brahman and what your teachers taught you, then you're in samsara and you're having many births and deaths and as I started this class out saying you don't know your line of births and deaths. You have to go to Krishna and, so, and he'll make some comment like yeah I learned all this from Vishvasvat and you'll say Vishvasvat he lived hundreds of years ago how'd you learn it from him? He says, because I was with him I had many bodies I know all my incarnations but you don't know any of yours yet so wake up, wake up and smell the Kali. <laughs> the Divine Mother it wants to inform you of your true nature. So you can be free like he was, like he is. So enough of desire-based projection and this solidification process. 
from here, if I'm looking at a couch or at a rug or at an ocean, then I should know that it's made of some sort of other particle. And we know that whether you measure it in microns or nanometers, that eventually there's a particle too small to measure. So what I am suggesting here is that maybe go inward and find a particle that is in your food and find a particle that's in your ancestors and find a particle that's in your mind and essentially define it some way as a particle of intelligence that's shining off of Om with a great light. When Om vibrates, what is the vibration that's coming off of that? We know that when ignorance vibrates, it's brooding and fear and ignorance, doubt. But what is it that's shining off of the word when it shines? It's pure intelligence. Pure intelligence. Sat Chit Ananda. It's the Chit part of Sat Chit Ananda. The Sat part is, is the ultimate truth and the Ananda part is what will happen to you after you realize truth and intelligence. Satchitananda, one of the most wonderful names for reality ever, ever devised, ever thought of, ever conceived of, Satchitananda. So that beautiful intelligent particle is there vibrating in everything. So start stripping the coverings off the gift. Start taking away all this overlay, this false superimposition of things and see it. You've heard that that it's done. Sometimes the shamans can see through to the prana, right? But see through the prana and then see the intelligent particle beyond that. And see through the intelligent particle to Om and see through that to the sun and get to the father through the sun. However you describe it, however you say it, that will be the inner spiritual journey per se. In perfection. And, and, and that will make a a god out of a man and a goddess out of a woman. Make a realized soul out of you. So next week we are going to go on in this vein and we'll do so by taking three other charts that have to do with the Upanishads and that connect very much to the uh, Ganamatra, but not so specifically as we were doing in these last four charts, these last four classes. So thank you, live streaming audience, for being with us. I'm sorry we lost you there for a little while if we did. And for all of you who came to attend here at this class in Hawaii, and we will now end with a chant, a brief chant, and uh, enjoy our evening in Brahman with our intelligent particles intact. <clears throat> Om Masato Ma Sadgamoya Tamaso Ma Joy Tir Gamoya Mrichor Ma Amritam Gamoya Abir Abir Mayiti Rudrayate Dakshina Mukam Te Namam Pahinicham Om Shanti 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 Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth from the unreal to the real, and from the illusion of death to eternal life, reach us through and through, O Lord and Mother, with thy sweet and benign presence. O peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Oh.